Thank you, Mr. Zuberg. Take your Bibles this morning. Turn over to Psalms 84. Psalms 84. If you would, please, Psalms 84 and... Okay, we going? There we go. Psalms 84. When you find your place, would you please stand if you're able to? And Psalms 84. We're going to read the entire psalm. One of my favorite psalms in the book of Psalms. Psalms 84. And we begin reading in verse number 1. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. And my heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be still praising thee, Selah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them, and who passing through the valley of Baca make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools, and they go from strength to strength, every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God, of Jacob, Selah. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. And I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. Uh, I love this part. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. What a great song. Let's go to the Lord. Father, Thank you for the wonderful promises in this psalm that tells us what the blessed man has and can have. Now, Lord, we need you to help, we need you to help us understand it. We need you to help us to place it into our hearts and to bring forth the fruit of the truth that is given to us in these scriptures. Now, please, Lord, please don't let us... And don't let this preacher especially, don't, don't let us be hearers of the words, but not doers of the words. Help us, Lord, to apply it. Help us to seek you through this message and to long for you through this message. And we'll thank you for it, Lord. No doubt in my mind we will. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated this morning. Now, um... The text of this message, and there could be so many texts in this message, but my text for this message this morning is Psalms 84, verse 5. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee. That's actually the title of the message. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them. Now, you know, through the years, there are those that have been in the ministry who have uh, served the Lord in a full-time capacity, and somewhere along the way, they are no longer in that. Uh, there are those who have been faithful goers to church, uh, who have served the Lord and uh, lived for the Lord, and even in a Christian home, but they too... Um, have gotten away from it. No longer are they in it. And what is? I think what happens is this. I think that there are Christians who get tired, they get weary, because, you know, to be a good Christian, it really is a battle. Somebody say amen. amen. It really is. To be a good Christian, to be a faithful Christian, it is a battle. And the Bible is very, very clear about that. And I think some get weary in that. And some, at some point, just, just walk away from it. doesn't mean they're, I don't think it means that they're not saved, but I think they, they, they try to walk away from that. 
And um, it'd be easy, and, and sometimes, unfortunately, Christians do this. It'd be easy to be critical of somebody like that. It could be easy to be judgmental of that person. But I want you to know something this morning. Um, it could be anybody. It can happen to anyone. And the fact of the matter is, according to this message this morning, you know what we need to learn? Especially as we come to an end of the year and the beginning of a new year. We need to learn to walk in the strength of God. We need to learn to walk in the strength of God. And that certainly is clear in these scriptures. And several times in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament and in the book of Psalms, we are exhorted in that one thing, to make the Lord our strength. For example, you don't need to turn there, but I'll read it to you, Psalm 28, 7. The, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and, and I loved, and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I praise him. Uh, uh, Psalms 118, verse 14. The Lord is my strength and Saw and has become my salvation. Isaiah 12, 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord, and that's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Jehovah, the all sufficient one is what Jehovah means, is my strength and my song. He has also become my salvation. You know, it's interesting that when you look at this understanding that the Lord is our strength, he is talking about there two things. He's talking about, first of all, that he can be your physical strength. God does give physical strength to a child of God. That is beyond our comprehension, by the way. And But, but primarily what he's referring to here is this thing of a spiritual strength that is needed in every believer's life. It's one thing to be saved. And it is another thing to know the spiritual strength of God working and upholding you each and every single day of your life. And if, if you've ever read anything about the history of Christians, we, you'll, this is what you'll always find, that Christians have done incredible things. I mean, I, I don't even have time to go into it all. If you read the history of our Christian faith, Christians have done incredible things, and they have endured extraordinary trials, extraordinary tribulations, extraordinary persecution, to the point to where you would think that they were superhuman. I mean, uh, someone who is tied to a stake and is burning, and they sing. They're able to sing as their body, their clothes are on. And typically when they would burn somebody at the stake, they would literally wrap, put several layers of clothes on them so that they, they really burn, and, uh, and so that the flesh just completely is fried. But while they are going through that, they they sing. And if you were listening carefully as I was reading those verses, one of, the, one of the constant things or the continuity of those verses is when the Lord is your strength, you get a song. You get a song. When he says, my, my heart greatly rejoiceth, he said. So there is, there is something to this thing of the strength of God being in a Christian's life. And it is due to the strength of the Lord in this life that we are able to live this life in a powerful, powerful way. And we are exhorted in the Scripture, and that is why we are exhorted, to be strong in the Lord. To be strong in the Lord. Are you strong in the Lord today? Could you say that you are? Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10, he said finally, and when he says finally, he's saying uh, last but not least. Finally, he says, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the, the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. See, the Lord's strength is one of the great secrets of a real and joyful and productive Christian life. Life and, and in Psalms 84, we learn about this blessed man, this man that is truly living a blessed life, not because of what he has, 
outside of him, but it is because of what he has inside of him that makes him a blessed man. And so I want you to see three things about this strength that David writes in this psalm. The first one I want you to see is the situations in which we are strengthened. I want you to look at the situations in which we are strengthened. Notice, if you would again, verse number 5 of Psalms 84. And look at it with me, please. Again, blessed is the man whose strength is in thee and whose heart are the ways of them. And then look what he says, who... That blessed man he's talking about now, passing through the valley of, what's that next word? Baca. The valley of Baca. Make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. Isn't that awesome? He maketh that valley of Baca a well. And it is a rain, and a, and a rain that filleth the pools. Now, the, the psalmist, when he talks about the valley of Baca, the word Baca means a uh, tear or to uh, weep. So it's, it's, and it's not exactly a place. Every commentary I read about it, there, there is not a place in Israel that is actually called the valley of Baca. But it was a, it was a place that people would travel. And there were certain places when they traveled through those valleys, they were a a place where it was very, very dry and very, very thirsty land. And for us, though, in the context of this message, the Valley of Baca is not a place that you go to. The Valley of Baca is a place that we all go to in our lives. Everybody goes through the Valley of Baca several times in our life. I'm talking about the Valley of Tears. I'm talking about the valley of weeping in your life. But for the man and for the woman whose strength is in the Lord, when he passes through this baca, this dry place, this thirsty place, when they go through it, they find that if they are the blessed man and they're doing it in the strength of the Lord, they find that the valley of baca, the valley that's dry, the, the, the place that is thirsty, the place that is filled with tears and weeping and hurt and, and troubles, that when you go through that, God makes it because of his strength a place that it actually becomes a well of living water. It actually becomes a place where the, uh, the showers of blessings, spiritual blessings come down and fill the pool. So as you go through it, you get this wonderful, nourishing strength from God. And so the Valley of Baca is something we go through periodically. Everybody has their Valley of Bacchus. Everybody has their time of weeping and burdens in their life. And the Valley of Baca is a situation and circumstances that we need the strength of God. Is as we go through these times that we need His strength to go through them to where we don't just endure them, but we actually grow in those times. I heard somebody say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And, and that's true. What, what doesn't stop you if you go through it and you go through it in the strength of the Lord, you don't just get through it. You actually come through it stronger than when you got into it. You come to it. Like, like it said of Job, he said, Job said that when he is done with me, I shall come forth as gold. And so the Valley of Baca is something God wants to use in our life, but He can't use it in our life if we're not going through it with the strength of God in our life. Why? Because blessed is the man whose strength is in the Lord. Israel was dry. Oh, a very dry, dusty place. But yet, if you have God's strength, God can make, no matter how dry, how dusty, how thirsty a time you're in in your life, hey, He can make it a place where there's waters and refreshment and greater living than you've never known before. It is the same for us in our journey. Turn over to Psalms 63, if you would, please. David, again, writes this. And David is going through a time where he is in the wilderness, and he spent much time in the wilderness. They, nobody knew about the wilderness life like David because that was where oftentimes he was having to hide when Saul was chasing. For 20 years, King Saul was chasing him, trying to kill him. Sometimes he did it with his men. Sometimes he was all by himself. But he knows what it's like to go through the wilderness and the valleys of Bacchus 
in his in life. And so look what he says in verse number one. He says, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land. By the way, you could put right there, Baca. And then where no water is. And then look what he says. To see thy power and thy glory, which is the result of God's power in his life, to where God is glorified, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Praise God that as you pass through your valley of Bacchus, that God has a spiritual strength and renewal that he will give you as you go through those valleys. question is, are you seeking that strength in your life? Now, here's also the crutch of this message. There, are, there is an avenue that God gives us here that actually helps us to understand how we receive the strength. I want you to notice at the end of verse number 2 of Isaiah, or rather Psalm 63. What does he say? So as I have seen thee in the what? Say that again, please. Sanctuary. You know, the tabernacle was called many different things. One of the things it was called was the sanctuary. Now go back over, if you would, to Psalms 80. Four, Psalms 84. And I want you to notice in Psalms 84, as we're talking about this blessed man uh, whose strength is in the Lord, I want you to notice it talks about in there, it talks about tabernacle. It talks about the courts of the Lord. It talks about the house or the Lord's house. It talks about altars in that thing. And I think, and I know, it's no accident he puts those in there because for our day that we live in, our sanctuary, our, uh, if you would, our tabernacle, our courts, our altar, our house that he is referring to there is a church. A church. A church is a place that God has ordained where Christians are able to get the blessing of spiritual strength in their lives. It is a church. God established the church that it would take part in our life to give us spiritual strength, to give us spiritual renewal, especially when we are spiritually weak and empty of strength and we feel like a parched desert. Sadly, often people, when they feel dry and thirsty and parched in their Christian life, you know what they do? They stay away from church. They stay away from home. They say things like, I don't feel like going to church today. They say things like, I just don't, I, 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 need, I just need to stay home today. And uh, it's been a tough week. And I just need to stay home and I just need to uh, I need to kick back. Or I've just I, I just don't seem to be getting anything out of this thing of going to church. And and by the way. That's one of the biggest mistakes you'll ever make as a child of God. That's like a cancer patient saying, you know, I'm not feeling good today, so I'm not going to go to the doctor and get my chemotherapy or my treatment or whatever it is I need to get. See, he's talking about a place where he would go to and he would get this spiritual strength. He would receive this spiritual blessing. Are there other places you get spiritual strength? Absolutely. Hey, reading the Bible, prayer, uh, those are certainly a given. We all know that. Boy, you need to have your own personal, devotional prayer time every single day in your life, and you get strength. But God has so ordained that one of the places that we go to and that we need as a child of God is just a good old-fashioned, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, Bible-teaching church. Amen? Amen? Need the church. We need the church. And what David was saying in Psalm 63 he was saying, boy, my soul thirsteth for thee. He said, my flesh longeth for thee. Listen, in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. You know this, and I'm just going to state the obvious here. We live in a dry and thirsty world. This is a dry and thirsty world. There is no spiritual strength. There is no spiritual nourishment. There is no spiritual renewing that you will ever find in anything in this world. Hey, I love going to a baseball game. Hey, I love going, maybe going to a football game. I, I love going out and doing things in this old world that there's nothing wrong with, but none of those are going to give me any spiritual strength. The only place that I really can go to is the church. 
I would have thought there would have been a, high, a louder amen there. Is the church. That is the place that we go to to get that spiritual strength. Man, uh, we, we, we don't, we are, we're not going to get it at home on Sundays. We're not going to get it at the park on Sundays. We're not going to get it uh, on the lake on Sundays. We're not going to get it from the deer stand on Sundays. Amen? We are not going to get it in an amusement park. None of those places are going to give you any spiritual strength on Sunday other than church. Church, the sanctuary, the tabernacle, the house of the Lord, the altars of God. And the psalmist is making the point that those dry times in our life is when we need to be in church the most. When you're feeling tired and weary in your spiritual life and you don't feel like you just got, you don't have it like you used to have it. In fact, you feel like you're going backwards instead of forwards in your Christian life. My friend, that is, that is a, a, a red flag that's telling you Man, I better get up this morning. I better get to church. I better get to church. Oh, he associates staying away from God's sanctuary, God's court, God's house, God's altars, like staying away from God. That's what he associates with. If you stay away from God and church, all you will do, listen, is you'll get drier and drier and dustier. Now, don't miss this. David said that he... He was thirsting for God. When you stay away from church, you'll get drier, but also what's going to happen, you're not going to get thirstier for God. You're going to begin to lose your thirst for God. You're going to begin to lose your thirst for God. See, one of the things that church does to the one that comes with the right attitude and the right heart is God will help to make you thirsty for God. God will begin to renew your spiritual desires in your life as you sing and as you give and as you uh, listen to the teaching and preaching of God's Word. It's, it's an, to me, the church is an amazing organism and organization. It really is. There's nothing like it in this world. Muslims don't have anything like it. Synagogue, uh, Jews really don't have anything like it, a place... They never, Muslims never associate a mosque with getting life, and Jews never associate a sanctuary, their, their um, uh, 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 synagogue with getting life. It's only the Christian faith. We associate a place that we go to where the Bible gives to us that we get strength from. That's why he says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and, and, and so much the more as you what? As you see the day approaching. It's just, and when you think about the letters in the New Testament, every one of them were written to a what? To a church. The Philippian church and the Galatian church and the Colossian church and the Thessalonican church and to a pastor Timothy and to a pastor Titus. Every, all of the New Testament was written to a church. So if you were a New Testament Christian, you didn't go to church, you would have got none of the word of God. That would have strengthened you and helped you. Oh, my. Church is important. You get drier. and You lose your thirstiness. Let me throw out a date for you. And don't answer this. Answer it in your own mind. Uh, March 15th, 2020. What does that mean to you? Don't say anything. March 15th, 2020. Here's what it should mean to you. And if you think about it and looked it up and Googled it, don't do that. That's when we got the word that they're closing down a country. I, I still, brother, listen, you, you, we were both here. When we got the word that uh, uh, we're, we're, they say we have to close down the country, close down the economy, churches can't meet. And that's when everything came to a standstill. When, the, when Roosevelt said about Pearl Harbor, it's a day that will live in infamy. When we think about 9-11, it is a day that will live in infamy. Quite frankly, in my mind, March 15, 2020 is a day that will live in infamy. Because it is on that day that we began to see the decline in our nation. 
more so than ever. We saw the decline socially. You've heard it. You listen to the news, all the things that have resulted socially in young people and people all over this country, all over this world. It, is, it has destroyed so many people by just put, telling them you have to stay in your house. It has declined our nation uh, uh, morally. It has declined our nation economically. But the thing that it has done most, it has declined our nation spiritually. Our nation has declined spiritually. We wonder, why is everything happening? It seems like, my goodness, it's, gets, it's getting worse faster than it has ever gotten worse. And I'm going to tell you why. Because our nation has declined in these last two to three years more because, you know why? Because people have been out of church. And church attendance has declined all over our country. Believers have declined all over our country. Christianity is not going up. Christianity is going down. And when you get people not going to church and you get Christians not living for the Lord, here's what's going to happen. You are going to see our nation get worse, not get better. And crime and, and perverseness of our nation. I mean, all these things are happening. And it started because this one statement, church is non-essential. Non-essential. And I'm going to tell you something. The church is probably the most essential thing in this, is the most essential thing in this country. It is the only thing that will ever preserve this country. It is the only thing that will ever help this country to get back on track. It will never be the White House. It will never be uh, uh, the senators of this country. It will never be the House of Representatives. It will always be the church. And that's what, why? Because that's where people get their strength. From the church. That's where you get your strength. Oh, yes, Bible time and prayer time and Doing that every day, I am for it, I do it. But I guarantee you, if I stopped going to church, it'd be, it'd be some weeks that I would stop doing it. Because the church is the catalyst. God knew that. God knew that God's people would be bombarded by so many things in this world throughout the week, and God in His wisdom gave to us the first day of the week. He said that, and He dubbed it in the Bible as the Lord's Day. Are you all with me? And first day of the week, the resurrection Sunday, and the Lord's day, and he said, not forsaking the assembling ourselves together. Why? Because he knew that we needed a time every week that we come together, we sing, we worship God, we praise God, we learn about the Word of God, we are preached to, we're taught, we make decisions, we make confessions, and God does a work in our life, and we leave, and we, go, and we, we can live for God again this week. And I think Wednesday is just as important. Man, that's a stepping stone to Sunday. And it is all so needed in our life. So God's plan through the church and through the preaching and through the singing and through the teaching and through praying and through giving, all of this, what helps us to give us the strength that we can live for God. Be the ones whose light so shine before man that they see our good works. And what do they do? They glorify our Father, which is in heaven. Man. I read about a fellow who skipped church on Sunday to go hunting. Now, of course, nobody would ever do that, right? But he did. He did. He skipped church. And it began to pour down rain. He slid inside a hollow log to stay dry. And when the rain quit, he started to slide out, but found that the rain had made the log swell, and he was stuck. As hard as he tried, he could not get out. He thought to himself, no one knows where I am, and they will never find me inside this log. I'm going to die in this log. Then he remembered it was Sunday, and that he should have been in church. And it made him feel so small, he was able to crawl out of that log. <laughs> Back to the matter is we allow too many things to keep us out of church. Fact of the matter is, the majority of Christians do not see church as essential. So we're, I've got to be there. I've got to be there. I need to get renewed. I need to get revived. And we're all going to have many situations in the upcoming year. As we look to 2023, I don't know what 2023 holds, but I do know there are going to be for me and for you some valleys of Baca. 
There's going to be some dry, dry days and thirsty days. But I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I don't know what you're going to do in 2023. But I am going to seek the Lord's strength in 2023. And I, because I want whatever happens, whatever comes my way, I want my valleys to be turned into wells of living water. And my pools to be filled with that wonderful showers of blessings in my life. And no matter what happens, I come out of it, I come out of the other side of that valley stronger than when I went into that valley. Why? Because I'm seeking the strength of the Lord. And one of the avenues I am seeking the strength of the Lord by just good old-fashioned going to church. Just being in church. Praise God. Praise God in our valleys valleys lord gives us strength in the times of our trials and tears he gives us strength as we face those valleys i love isaiah 40 verse number 29 he says he giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might he increaseth strength that's god's promise amen that's god's promise deuteronomy 33 25 and as thy days Show, so shall thy strength be. So, when we, you feel spiritually dry, spiritually drained, remember what I said. You need to be in church. You know, my, I've talked about it a little bit. I talk more about with Brother Liston than anybody, but my cousin got saved when he came out here. And, um, man, one of the most exciting things I'll ever have seen in my life was preaching and seeing my cousin raise his hand back there, having not seen him for 40 years. And I met him at my dad's funeral. We got together. My, he's maybe even watching. I don't know. He should be in church. If you are, Phil, get to church. And, and, and so we sat together, chatted a little bit. We kind of just, it, it actually was like we had, we'd, hadn't seen him just a couple days. And, we, and it was this wonderful. And he said, Joe, he said, I, I want to come out and see you. And so I'm going down to Kentucky or something, and, and we're going to drive all the way over. And he did. I, I didn't think he'd do it. I really didn't. You know how many people say, boy, I'd love to come out and see you. And it never happens. But he did it. He came out. And you, you all know that. And he s- sat back there, and he got saved. I mean, he got saved. Amen. He got saved. And, man, he's so excited. I, I got all these. I've saved all his texts. And every time he sends me a text, he just, man, just blesses my heart. Amen. And Thanksgiving. I, um, I, I sent him a book to read. I sent him a Bible, and I've, I've been trying to help him. And, but, I, of course, I, t- I found him some churches. I said, there are three churches here in Massachusetts near you. I said, I don't know much about them. They were recommended to me. I'm recommended to you. I said, go, go see them and, and let me know. I hadn't heard from them for a while. Then Thanksgiving, I sent him a Thanksgiving text and said, Happy Thanksgiving and all that. Thank the Lord. I, said, I, I told him, I said, Phil, I just thank God so much that you got saved. I said, one of the greatest blessings of my life is to see you get saved under my preaching. And, and so he texts me back. Here's, here's what he texts me back. He said, Joe, he said, I've gone to church more in the last four months than I have in 40 years. <laughs> and, and don't miss, new Christian. And here's what he said. He said, I'm even going on Wednesdays. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's what it's all about, friend. My brother Phil is connected now. And he understands. He understands. If you are going to have spiritual strength, sure, have your, get up in the morning and walk with God. Get up in the morning and walk in your Bible. Get up in the morning and marvel in the presence of God in your life. But none of that is a replacement a good old-fashioned, local Bible-believing church. Right. Nothing. And that will give you strength and your family strength. And i got to quit here. Oh, my goodness, i got so much more good stuff. Amen! I just want to take off right now. But we'll get into it here. The situations in which you get strength, that's the first point. My friend, when you go through the valley, of, and you are, some of you are right there now. But if you, are, if you are not now, you will be, probably even before the end of the year. But you're going to go through it. And you will not, blessed is the man whose strength is in what? The Lord. 
Because then he says he'll take that valley of Baca and he'll make it wells. And he'll fill the pools with rain. Doesn't that sound good? Sounds wonderful. Just like the Italian food we're going to have at the adult activity <laughs> this coming Friday. Amen? I, end, I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. Would you bow your head, please, for prayer? Would you bow your head, please, for prayer? I, I, I wonder this morning, got a couple more points, and we'll, we'll do that tonight, but I wonder this morning, I wonder if somebody would, first of all, two things. Number one, confess that, that Pastor, I, I need, I need the strength of God in my life. I need the strength of God. I've not been seeking, but I know in my heart I need God's strength right now. Is there anybody that raised their hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I need God's strength. Would you lift it up good and high? Say, Pastor, I need God's strength. Thank you. Thank you. And the honest truth is, everybody should have his hand raised. We all need God's strength, but especially of those who haven't been seeking the strength of the Lord. And then number two, I wonder how many would say, Pastor, I church has been non-essential in my life. I go, but it, it's not essential. It's not numero uno. It's important in my life like it should be, and I know that, and I'm only kidding myself. Pastor, please pray for me. Pray for me. That church will be the essential that God wanted it to be. Would you lift your hand to say, Pastor, pray for me. It's not been essential, but I want it to be essential. Anybody? Lift it up. Good, good. Let's all stand together, please. And I wonder, as you're standing, I wonder, is your head bowed and your eyes closed? There's somebody here to say, Pastor, I'm not even saved. And I'm going to tell you something. Church will do nothing.